Aloha, happy Wednesday, everyone. It's 1030 here in the islands, and that means it is time for Spotlight Hawaii. I'm Yenji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji. And Ryan, today we have a very special guest to talk about a wide variety of topics. That's right. Always great to have Governor David Ige join us for the conversation. He joins us this morning live from the Hawaii State Capitol. Good morning, Governor. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, good morning, uh, Ryan and Yanji. Thank you again for giving me this opportunity. I, I enjoy the conversations we've had and being able to respond to questions from the people. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Governor, let's start off with the vaccination. Obviously, uh, uh, that is, continues on. Hawaii actually got high remarks in a report that was released earlier this week about the actual vaccination plan that the state has put forth. As we continue to see more of the general population get vaccinations, what can you tell us about this timeline and how things are going with this vaccination process. You know, Ryan, it's uh, it has been a great uh, partnership with the Biden administration. They really have been listening and responding to our suggestions. You know, we had told them early on that getting more advanced notice of how much vaccine is really important, and that allows us to have a real smooth rollout. Allows us to know how many uh, how much vaccine we're getting, so we can schedule people. And, you know, Hawaii is one of the few places um, that uh, it really is uh, very organized. You know, most people report to me that they're spending maybe 20 to 30 minutes uh, vaccinate, uh, in the vaccination station. And remember, we're, we're observing them for 15 minutes before they leave. So uh, all of the sites have really uh, done a terrific job. Uh, you know, we are getting, uh, we're over 500,000 uh, doses administered. Um, you know, I did have a call on with the White House and um, and Dr. Char and the Hawaii team to really talk about ways that we can improve uh, coordination of the federal programs and the state programs. You know, we have the same goals. Um, we're committed as a broad distribution as we can, involving all the pharmacies statewide, uh, all of the community health centers, which really um, allow us to reach uh, those that most need it, you know, the Pacific Islanders and those that are overrepresented in the cases that we're seeing. Uh, and, um, th you know, things are going well. Given the pace of vaccinations right now, when do you anticipate, you know, everyone essentially who wants a vaccine being able to get one? Is that sometime still midsummer? Do you think that'll happen earlier or later than that? I think, you know, um, Yanji, as you know, President Biden really put out the market there for May 1st, and we're working toward that. But, you know, we we have been very methodical about what we um, wanted to do. We didn't want to have that situation where we had so many people eligible uh, and very few um, appointments that people get frustrated. Um, and so... I think we are on track. I spoke with Dr. Char this morning and we're getting about 68,000, 70,000 doses per week now. So about half of those go to second doses, half to first doses. We are pretty much on track to be in and around May 1st uh, that we would uh, be open to most people. You know, it might slip a, a week uh, or two. Um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, um, you know, we've seen tremendous um, uh, people, many people want to get the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, so we're excited about that. Uh, we should be getting uh, more doses of Johnson and Johnson in the next week or so, and then there will be a steady supply of uh, Johnson and Johnson that we'll be distributing, uh, and that's a, a pretty significant increase to the number of doses that we have. Uh, so I do think we're on track uh, to to meet the president's goal. You know, it might be a week or two um, later, but, um, you know, vaccine, vaccinations are going really well. You know, you mentioned moments ago that you had a call with the White House and you talked about some of this vaccination process. Is there anything, uh, any updates that you can provide us on that conversation that you had with them looking long term at the general population and this whole vaccin vaccination plan? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we're proud of what we're doing. You know, we're one of the few states, uh, we, we're involving all of our community health centers because we know that they reach a, a real important uh, population. And we were ahead of the curve in, in involving all of our pharmacies, big and small, all across the state. You know, we, I did ask specifically about vaccination for children. You know, I know that I get that question a lot about our students. Um, they are, there are um, 
clinical trials now for vaccination of um, high school age kids. Uh, some of the vaccines already are approved for 16, but uh, there will be more uh, work done. Uh, so they do anticipate um, having a vaccine available for uh, high school kids um, probably uh, around the end of the summer. Um, but they, they did say that vaccination for younger children, uh, middle school and, and uh, elementary school children is really out in the future. Uh, they don't anticipate uh, any vaccine for younger children until 2022. Um, so that was, um, you know, um, interesting to hear. I know that I get that question a lot, especially as we talk about uh, getting back to in-person learning in public schools. You know, sticking with vaccines, one of the things that we have seen just over the last week are the, is an influx of tourists. Um, mm -hmm. Just, you know, you go to any beach and it's really sort of startling because we've been so used to seeing so many just come aina on the beaches and then suddenly um, sharing our space again with the visitors. What's the a conversation right now about this vaccine passport idea, allowing the va visitors to come in uh, under the Safe Travels program, but bypassing quarantine or testing requirements? Is there any update on that? Yeah, cer certainly um, in my call with the White House, I personally had asked uh, Jeff Zients, the, the um, White House uh, COVID coordinator, about um, the progress of the vaccine passport. Uh, he, he calls it a uh, vaccine validation. And um, we're going to be specifically talking about that in the next call next week. Um, it is something that they are aware of. And especially for uh, Hawaii, we, we know how important it is. Um, so we will be talking about that more next week. It, it's something that's on their radar. Obviously, you know, it is more future. Uh, we need to get more people vaccinated. But um, definitely as we get into the summer and, uh, you know, for Hawaii especially, we want to be able to understand, um, you know, what vaccinated people, what risks they might present and how we might be able to bring uh, travelers who have been vaccinated. And I know this is a question that we bring up all the time, but the neighbor island travel and the current plan, uh, the current protocol right now is that you also need to get a testing or go into this uh, quarantine period. We spoke to many of the mayors here on this program. They said they'd be open to lifting the uh, neighbor island travel. What is the conversation right now regarding travel between the neighbor islands? You know, uh, Ryan, we were making good progress. As you know, um, the cases were dropping significantly in January and February. But uh, since the beginning of March, we've seen an increase in the cases, especially here on Oahu. You know, and we went from a statewide average of uh, 20 and 30, and then it quickly went to 40 and then 50 and then 70. And, you know, we're almost uh, up to uh, 100 uh, cases per day again. And that's a real concern. So, you know, we definitely look at it uh, every uh, every week and we do have conversations with the mayor. Right now, the case counts are going in the wrong direction. And so, you know, especially with the um, moving of Oahu to tier three recently, you know, there has been a relaxation of restrictions. We do want the case counts to stabilize before we make any changes. and. We do know that inter-island travel does um, change the makeup in each of the counties, and we want to be careful that uh, that we don't start another surge that would lead to a much, much uh, more devastating shutdown again. We're getting a couple of questions this morning about enforcement. Uh, this one from Misty says, why are these large weddings and concerts reported on the news being allowed without consequences on Oahu? I'm not, if you're, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, um, the video clips that she's uh, talking about, but these have been circulating online. There was a, a, a reportedly a 700 plus person wedding a few weeks ago on the North shore. Uh, there was some video of, of, you know, a bunch of people packed into a Quonset hut um, at a concert recently, you know, when you see clips like that, what goes through your mind and what more do you think can be done when it comes to enforcement? You know, I, I am definitely concerned with uh, those kinds of events. Those are exactly the events that should not be happening because they can become a uh, super spreader events. And I know Yanji in many instances, um, they, they, people are not wearing masks and clearly they're not um, maintaining social distance. You know, that's uh, the concern that all of us have. We don't want to see another increase in the, in the case counts. 
especially because we know the vaccines are here, they're rolling out, we're getting, you know, now we're up to 60,000 uh, vaccinations per week. Uh, hopefully with the Johnson & Johnson in the next week or so, we'll be able to uh, vaccinate even up to 80,000 um, that um, to let our guard down now to see these mass events, you know, it doesn't take much. And I think you guys have seen uh, it doesn't take much for a uh, infected individual to get into one of these events, and then suddenly we'll see tens and twenties and maybe even hundreds of cases. Uh, and it's too early. Uh, you know, I just want to remind everyone: it's too early to let our guard down. We need to be vigilant. We need to wear our masks. We need to maintain distance. You know, vaccines are here. We are rapidly approaching herd immunity, but there's still more work to be done. One of the uh, conversations that we had and made headlines last week was that of weddings and those being allowed here on the island of Oahu. We know that on, on Maui County, weddings are allowed, of, I believe, a group of 100 as long as there's a wedding coordinator and a person responsible for that. And that's what many on the island of Oahu are calling for, but a smaller size of 25. We spoke to the mayor last week. We said that's a conversation that he would be having with you and Dr. Char. Can you update us on the uh, weddings and here on the island of Oahu and if you would be open to allowing some sort of wedding capac uh, and, and capacity limits to happen uh, here on the island of Oahu? Yeah, certainly, Ryan, we are talking about that. And, um, you know, it is about um, the size of the weddings. You know, on Maui, they allow outdoor weddings only. And uh, it is about someone being responsible and accountable. Uh, you know, we are uh, meeting with industry people and reviewing protocols, uh, and we are uh, definitely having conversations. You know, again, the concern that we have is that we have seen this uh, pretty rapid increase in cases uh, here on Oahu uh, that we're concerned about. So uh, we just remind everyone that, um, you know, we do need to make personal sacrifices and wear a mask and maintain distancing. If we see the case counts uh, increase again, then you know we won't be able to uh, go to um, dropping restrictions and allowing more activities to occur. This is a, a different topic, and I know this is a city, not a state project, but we'd like to get your thoughts. Irwin asks, what does the governor think about the rail overcost? Is killing the project an option? $3 billion in 10 years more. Uh, you know. This is something that has been in the news quite a bit. Lori Kahikino was on this program. She said it was three billion, and then a few days later, it looks like it's three and a half billion. Uh, just would love to get your thoughts on that, and also some reports of some problems with the route itself now. Yeah, so I th all of those reports are very concerning to me. Uh, you know, the rapid increase in the cost is is uh, again uh, just making it a much bigger challenge. I do believe that the transit system is the best option for transportation here in the islands. You know, I know that we need to finish the project. You know, I, I represented Pearl City during a lot of that construction and a lot of people sacrificed during um, putting up that transit way uh, through Waipahu, Ayao, Pearl City. Um, you know, we were making a tremendous progress for such a long time. Uh, we have to find a way to f to finish the project. You know, uh, the president uh, is talking about a big infrastructure bill. I'm hoping that that happens. I'm hoping that that might lead to additional support from the federal government. Uh, as you know, they've uh, had a fixed share in the cost, uh, even though the cost of this project has risen. So, you know, I'm hopeful that the Congress uh, can find common ground on infrastructure, and I'm hopeful that. Um, you know, additional funds maybe um, can be part of that package coming from the federal government. Um, you know, I know that uh, Mayor Blangiardi is um, getting to understand the project better at this point in time. And, you know, I, I would like to see it completed. It needs to be completed. Another issue and something that's moving through the legislature is the legalization of marijuana here in Hawaii. I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Would that be a bill if passed through the legislature that is something that you would sign into law here? You know, Ryan, as I said, I, I'll always look at and review the legislation passed by the legislature and, and trying to make some decision. I've been asked before, and I do oppose legalization of marijuana as long as it's a Schedule One controlled substance by the federal government. You know, I, I think having uh, different uh, laws here 
uh, and allowances uh, with the federal government really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I do think that it puts um, people and the community in jeopardy because they might think that it's legal in Hawaii, but if they cross a federal boundary, uh, they do co commit a felony offense from the federal government's perspective. And I think that that is just not a good situation to be in. So is that something that you'd want to veto or is that something you're still open to? I mean, I, I would uh, review the bill, Yanji, if it comes through, but I, I do have a big concern. And, um, you know, depending, I, I can't imagine how they could legalize it with it being a controlled, uh, uh, controlled substance with the federal government. Also, I wanted to get uh, an update and your thoughts on, on what's happening with the TMT project. We know that that has been put on hold uh, right now. A any updates on what's happening with that project and has COVID-19 impacted the progression of that project moving forward? Uh, I don't think that it's uh, COVID-19 has had any specific impact on the project. Uh, I know that the project um, sponsors were uh, going and working with the National Science Foundation. Uh, to seek um, um, federal money in support of the project. Um, they are waiting for the decadal study, which is uh, uh, every decade, uh, the science community in the United States I cut, gets together and identifies uh, projects that they believe are priority uh, for funding uh, from the National Science Foundation. So I believe that that process is in process. Um, we, I haven't heard any specific uh, comments from the TMT project um, for, you know, a year and a half now. Christine Donnelly, who writes the Kokua column, has a question. She says, what relief is available for landlords whose tenants are protected from eviction but who are not paying rent? Are there any new funding programs specifically for residential landlords in this situation? We've heard a lot about rental relief, but what about the landlords? Um, thanks for that question. And, and Christine, I might circle back to you to get uh, more information. Uh, a lot of the rental relief actually provided direct payments to the landlords. You know, there was a concern uh, with the program that um, if we provide uh, relief to someone for their rent and they took the money and they spent it on something else, that really wouldn't be helpful. So, um, for the state program, um, we uh, required that the funds go directly to the landlord to pay the rent. Um, there, uh, the last couple of federal programs have relaxed those uh, restrictions. They've said that if the landlord refuses to accept the money um, from the government, that we could provide direct payments to the tenants themselves. Uh, so, you know, we continue to make the programs work the best that we can. We do want to see if there's rent relief provided that it should go to the landlords and it shouldn't be uh, spent on other things uh, unless the landlord refuses to participate in the program. You know, as we see more and more people begin coming back to the islands, of course, spring break is happening. And so we're seeing that large influx right now. We're also seeing some incredibly long lines at Hawaii's airports uh, throughout the state because of this new added process of having to check each person coming in and verifying their COVID-19 testing. Is there anything the state is doing to help expedite that process, knowing that these visitor arrivals could continue to ramp up? Uh, and uh, your thoughts on just what the wait times are right now for those who are coming into the state? Yeah, th that's a terrific uh, question, Ryan. And I, I really want to encourage uh, all of those traveling to really talk with your airline providers. We've had terrific uh, um cooperation from some of the airlines and we've actually implemented a pre-travel uh, pre-check program uh, for some of the airlines where when you uh, register on um, and get on your flight they check to make sure that uh, the test was done and completed in time and you pass all our requirements uh, and they've been giving a wristband so that when they arrive uh, they show their wristband and they really fly through the airport with no delay at all. Uh, some of the airlines are not participating in that program. So uh, if, if I was traveling, I would specifically, specifically ask if, if you're uh, participating with the pre-check program, uh, and if those airlines are, then I would definitely book flights on, on those airlines. 
You know, one of the things that some people are starting to take pictures of and document on Facebook are just visitors who are in our community who may have different mask mandates at home and perhaps are not wearing a mask, perhaps, you know, out of ignorance, not understanding that we have a mask mandate, even when you are outside, not just indoor uh, in businesses and whatnot. Um, what is being done to make sure that the travelers who are visiting here are educated and um you know, well-versed in our laws. And can you tell us, are there updates? Uh, I know that there was a push uh, to have it be a citation of maybe a hundred or $150. Where is that in the process? Is that something that you anticipate uh, passing soon? Yeah, certainly, uh, Angie. We have been working with the visitor industry quite heavily and um, all the airlines uh, have included uh, messages uh, during the pre-flight uh, um, um, videos that are shown uh, that talks about Hawaii having a mask mandate and that, you know, that uh, people are required to wear masks here. Uh, we've also been working with the hotel industry and they have included within their uh, internal video systems uh, and the messaging and signage uh, that reminds uh, visitors that uh, we do have a mask mandate uh, and that they are required to wear masks indoors and outdoors. Uh, anytime that they're within six feet of uh, another individual. So, um, you know, and we do know that um, the, the hotels especially have been uh, reminding visitors and uh, making sure that they understand that uh, it is a requirement here. Um, you know, in, in terms of uh, the penalty, we did introduce legislation and uh, we had advocated that we establish a fine system uh, unfortunately, those bills have died in the legislature. So, you know, the only penalty that we can enact now is a misdemeanor. Um, you know, we'll be back next year to try and see if the legislature will agree with allowing us to find people rather than just finding them guilty of a misdemeanor. Uh, we are still getting questions about rental relief. Uh, we know that we spoke about the landlords and, and direct payments to them, but what about those who are looking for assistance uh, on the rental side? Is that something that will continue to come out and, and where can people get more information about that? Yeah, Ryan, we just um, got uh, additional funds for rental and mortgage relief and uh, we are working with the counties. You know, we've uh, uh, provided that. So if someone is interested in rent or mortgage relief, uh, they should look at the county websites. You know, we've been coordinating. You know, we've learned a lot as the state tried to stand up the program, you know, trying to find the balance. You know, it's unfortunate that we see so much attempts at fraud uh, during these uh, programs. Uh, but I think we've uh, found a balance about how to confirm that someone is impacted by COVID uh, in, um, you know, a way that doesn't create additional barriers. Uh, and we are working with all the counties now to implement uh, a rent and mortgage relief programs uh, in each county. Uh, Chelsea Moore has, has a question she's posted quite a few times, so I want to make sure we get to it. She says, I want to know about Bill SB 614, not paying state taxes on unemployment benefits. What's the progress on this bill? What's your view on that? Should uh, unemployment benefits be exempt from state taxes? Um, you know, Yanji, um, we have always uh, taxed uh, unemployment benefits um, here in Hawaii, and um, you know we were planning to tax um, benefits. I know that there are measures in the legislature, and I, I apologize, I don't have the status on that measure. Uh, but one of the things in the American Rescue uh, Bill says that we cannot um, provide tax relief with the the ARPA funds if we accept ARPA funds. So. You know, we're trying to understand exactly what that means. Um, you know, the general guidance is we, we can't provide uh, any law that reduces or delays payment of taxes that existed uh, when the law was passed in March of this year. Uh, so, um, you know, we want to make sure that we can accept the money. Uh, and if part of that means we can't give tax relief, then uh, we won't be. You know, about a year ago, uh, one of your last public appearances was at a UH men's volleyball match with Hawaii playing BYU, sold out Stancher Center, 10,000 plus fans there. Uh, and then we went into lockdown. And since then, obviously, sporting events have been canceled. But recently, the Big West 
uh, has allowed com uh, schools within the conference to decide how they want to plan on bringing fans back safely. Uh, with Hawaii's numbers being some of the lowest in the country, is that something that we could potentially see is fans being allowed back at University of Hawaii sporting events to some capacities in arenas like the Stan Sheriff Center? Yeah, you know, Ryan, it, it's just a couple of things. Um, generally, uh, outdoors is better than indoors. And so, uh, you know, it's always a concern for indoor events. Uh, you know, I am uh, talking with uh, David Lasner. I know that, you know, I, it's exciting to go to UH sports events and I'm alumni uh, true and true and really enjoy uh, going to that. And, you know, we are trying to work to get, um, you know, life back to the new normal. And so that's certainly something that I would um, want to consider. And I'll be talking with uh, Dr. Lasner and the university people uh, and uh, Dr. Char to think about, you know, is there a safe way to do it? You know, we have learned a lot across the country, you know, different um, conferences and different uh, universities are doing things differently. Um, and so, you know, we wanna look at the best practices and, and see, uh, what we can do to get back to normal in terms of UH athletics. I want to circle back to the vaccine. I know we're running out of time, but there was a question. I can't find it right at the moment. Oh, here we go. Um, Noelani says, should essential workers decide whether they get vaccinated or not? Because my husband's job is trying to put, push him to get vaccinated. Um, this is sort of a larger question, really. You know, so much of the focus has been on getting the vaccine to people who want it. And then the conversation, I imagine, will soon shift to getting the vaccine to people who might have some reluctance. Uh, what's the state doing to help convince people that it is safe? And and what are the thoughts on having any kind of a max vaccine mandate? I assume if it's a private employer, you can have requirements um, that, you know, that require certain inoculations, but, you know, what, how do we, how do we navigate this part of the vaccine process? Yeah, uh, certainly, uh, Yanji, I, I do appreciate that. I want to make it real clear right now that, uh, all vaccinations are voluntary, that no one, uh, has mandated or no one has required uh, someone to take a vaccine. Um, you know, the guidance that we've uh, heard from the CDC and that we've relayed to employers is, uh, just a reminder that the vaccines at this point in time is approved under a, a emergency use authorization only. Um, and so the, the recommendations made is that uh, employers can uh, mandate it for the employees if they want to. Uh, but generally, they're saying that, um, you know, it would be safer to wait until the vaccine uh, completes the, the regular authorization for use uh, prior to uh, ordering the vaccine um, for employees. You know, I, uh, I haven't heard of any employer requiring employees to get vaccinated. I know that many have uh, implemented uh, incentives uh, to encourage people to get vaccinated. Uh, for the state of Hawaii, we've allowed uh, employees time off, pay time off to get vaccinated if they choose to, um, but um, we're not mandating vaccinations at this point in time. Governor, as our time winds up here, I wanted to provide you an opportunity to have any last thoughts or comments or, or, that you may have for our viewers here this morning. No, I just really wanted uh, to thank everyone again. You know, Hawaii continues and still leads the country in the lowest per capita infection rates. Uh, and the lowest um, mortality rates. And it really is because people have taken personal responsibility, you know, and I, I appreciate everyone sacrificing something to keep our community uh, healthy and safe. Uh, vaccinations are rolling out. And when, you're t when it's your turn, I certainly uh, encourage you to get vaccinated. Uh, the vaccines are safe. And I think most importantly, um, all of the approved vaccines have, have shown that they reduce the seriousness of illness uh, should you get infected. And in many instances, uh, it's prevented death from occurring. Um, so I, I definitely personally encourage everyone to get vaccinated when it's your turn. Uh, it's safe and it will um, you know, improve your health. Uh, and uh, just to everyone else, just thank you for your patience. You know, we are making uh, significant progress. I'm proud of the state of Hawaii because uh, we have stuck together. And I think most importantly, uh, we've uh, been able to keep our community healthy and safe.
Uh, aloha and mahalo. Thank you so much, Governor David Ige, for spending so much time with us on this Wednesday morning. We appreciate it. Mahalo. Thank you. Mahalo. Wow, Ryan, you know, I, I have to admit that I don't track every bill on the ledge. And my assumption was that the mask mandate uh, becoming a misdemeanor, you know, a, a fine as opposed to the misdemeanor system that is in place now was sort of marching on through. It wasn't something that I was closely tracking because I figured that it was a given. And uh, it was definitely surprising to me to hear that that measure died. Uh, you know, we talked about a lot of ground, we covered a lot of ground today, but that in particular really caught my attention. Yeah, we'll have to wait to see what happens with the legislature. I mean, oftentimes, just because a bill has been deferred or dies doesn't mean that there isn't a way for it to be installed in some other piece of legislation. And so those are conversations that I'm sure lawmakers will continue to have because it did seem like it had broad support on both sides of the House and the Senate going into the session about this. And so we'll have to continue to track and see where that lands up. Of course, we talked about a number of other legislative matters that are currently moving through the, the, um, the legislature right now beyond just COVID, uh, including uh, the marijuana legalization. Governor continuing to say that he will not support uh, that type of legalization or that bill if it should come across his desk. That's right. And he also talked about vaccines. Uh, it sounds like we're on track to get there by May 1st uh, for everybody who wants one over the age of 16. Um, but he did say that in his conversations with the White House, it doesn't sound like vaccines will be available to people younger than that until probably 2022. Uh, so it'll be a while. But of course, those clinical trials, especially for the youngest of the children, uh, have to be completed to make sure that they are safe. Um, he talked about trying to raise awareness to the visitors that you know they we do have the mask mandates uh, both um, indoors and out, and then also this idea of vaccine passports. I believe he called it vaccine verification, and saying that that's a conversation that he's going to be having more in depth with the White House next week. Yeah, and but it does not sound like something that will be happening anytime soon. There's still a lot of conversations and logistics that need to be worked out on that. And and with regards to neighbor island travel and lifting the requirements that are currently in place, it doesn't seem as though that's going to be changing anytime soon as his concerns over the rising numbers that we have seen. He's saying the counts are going in the opposite direction. Not necessarily that we're seeing any significant surge right now, but that the case counts are increasing and definitely not where they want to be going in terms of making a decision to lift any of those types of register. Uh, any types of bans that are currently in place right now. Yeah, and all of this, of course, ties into travel and to the visitor industry. On Friday, we have Peter Ingram from Hawaiian Airlines. He's going to be joining us to talk about what the airline is doing to make sure that people are, you know, abiding by the safe travels regulations. And also, uh, the airline has opened several new routes to new states. Uh, so what is the profile of the visitor that we're seeing? We're going to be covering all of that with uh, Peter Ingram. Yeah, an interesting conversation is going to happen there because some of those states, uh, including Florida, including Texas, we know that they tend to be a little more loose in their, uh, you know, mask mandates and, and the things that are happening in those states. And so with new routes to those destinations, that's something that we definitely want to have that conversation and getting an update on the status of the overall company. Uh, of course, they were initially struggling at the beginning of the pandemic and see how things have turned around since travel has picked up. Again, that is a conversation that we're having with Peter Ingram on Friday. For those of you who have questions uh, for Dr. Libby Char, she'll be joining us a week from today on Wednesday, and Lieutenant Governor Josh Green is joining us on Monday. So we've got a lot of shows and a lot of guests, great guests to talk with. Uh, we appreciate all of you for being here. Thank you so much for all of the comments and the questions. They really do help drive the conversation. Please like and share this. Uh, and until Friday, we wish you a fond aloha. Stay safe out there. Aloha. We'll see you then.